I think we might have a problem. I'm afraid that I suspect that there is actually a typo in our gospel reading this morning. I mean, think of it. How could Jesus, this incredible teacher, this incredible preacher, a speaker without compare, one day talking to his disciples, how could the best illustration that he could possibly come up with is to look around and see some wildfire flower growing nearby and say, ah, consider that. I mean, how could the guy who came up with incredible sayings like, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the spirit of uh, the kingdom of heaven, and do unto others as you would have others do unto you. How could the best he come up with one day be considered a little bit? I think it's a type. Do you agree? No? <laughs> no, you think it's actually a, a deeply profound uh, teaching that if we took it seriously might just transform our lives? Well, you're correct. Now, if only we could actually take it to heart and let it transform our lives. But just for now, would you, would you suspend all that and, and go with me for a minute? Wouldn't it be so cool, so appropriate, so meaningful for us today if what Jesus actually meant to say was, consider the little. I'll tell you what I mean. <clears throat> this passage that we read this morning has long been one of my favorite passages of, of Jesus' words from the Gospels. I have preached on it, I've read it many times, I've applied it to my life many times, preached on it many times, including at least once a year at St. Andrews. And I find myself, therefore, in a rather embarrassing position. Because I'm going to admit to you this morning, and I think that I have, up until now, actually missed the point of this passage. You see, I always assumed that this passage was all about worry, and anxiety, but that's what the subject was. In my own defense, I had good reason for assuming that. Because just about every Bible I've ever read, every translation on this passage put a title. And the title was always something like On Worry and Anxiety. So that's what I assumed it was about. But as I looked at it more closely, thinking about preaching on it today, I realized that actually Jesus is talking about something else. Yes, it, it delivers all kinds of teachings about worry and anxiety and how useless they are. Teachings we should take to heart. But these things are not the point. The point of the passage is something else. Think. Think about the people listening to Jesus that day. Who was he talking to? Who was in the crowd? Almost all of them would have been peasant farmers and agricultural laborers of one sort or another. That's what people did in Palestine. Those were the people listening to Jesus. And how would such people have heard what he was saying? He talked to them in terms they could understand. That's why almost all of his parables, all of his sayings, drew on images from the agricultural world. He talked about sowing and planting and growing and harvesting, as he does indeed in this passage. Consider the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. But how would the people in the crowd have heard that? As he talked to them about sowing, they would have said, oh yeah, sowing, we know that. We know all about sowing. We break our backs so every year. And when Jesus started talking about harvesting, they thought of the long days during harvest season they put in. They got up before the sun in the morning, they worked all day long until after the sun had gone down at night. Harvest was work for them. And when he talked about gathering in the barns, they did that work too. They did it until their muscles were so sore they could barely move. They knew everything about hard work. Now actually, most of them 
didn't really get the benefit of those full barns at the end of the year. All of the produce gathered into barns went to the landowners, went to the landlords, went to the tax man. The actual workers got very little. So as they thought about harvest time, they didn't think about what they got out of it. They thought about the work they put into it. And that's what Jesus is talking about this passage. Look at the verbs that he used. Jesus talks about sowing and reaping and gathering. He talks about toiling and spinning. He talks about people who strive for things. He's talking about work. The work that people do. So this is not really a passage about worry. It is a passage about work. And because of that, I think that this is a passage that has a great deal to say to us today in our modern world. Because we are living in a world that is all about work. We are living in a world that is all about all the things that people do, about how busy everybody is. People are going and going and going from first thing in the morning to late, late, late at night. Wherever they go, they take phones and other devices with them that allow them to do all of the stuff they need to do. You ask most people what's going on in their life. Nine times out of ten, what's the answer you'll get? Oh, I'm so busy. So much to do. And if you run across that one person who, for whatever reason, doesn't have a lot on their plate right now, Chances are they'll apologize. <coughs> they'll, they'll make excuses. Yeah, I don't have a lot on the go right now. But, but I'm going to have this big project coming in in a couple of weeks, and then I'll be running like crazy. See, busyness has become the norm for us. Busyness has become life itself. And when we're not busy all the time, we're just not quite sure what to do. Jesus talks about busyness. Now, it's not that Jesus has anything against work. I mean, Jesus knows the value of a good, hard day's work. He was a carpenter. He put in long days of good, hard work himself. He's not speaking against work. But I think he is challenging us to think and think carefully about why we work. Why we are so busy, what we are really doing. And I, and, and I don't think he would be satisfied if he just said, Oh, I, I'm busy, I work hard because I have to earn money to get the stuff I want or need. I don't think Jesus would be answered happy with that answer. He would challenge you to go deeper and say, Yeah, but why do you need what you think you need? Why do you want what you think you want? And sometimes I think Jesus would challenge us because we're so busy all the time that we don't think of some of the deeper reasons that go to our business. Sometimes, actually, we are busy, and I know this is something that applies to me a lot, quite often. I am busy because it makes me feel important. I mean, when my agenda is full, when I got a long list of things to do, I feel significant. I feel important. Even if, and this is sometimes the case, the stuff I'm busy doing isn't really important stuff. Just the fact I'm so busy makes me feel important. And when I don't have a lot of stuff on my plate, I start to feel as if I'm falling short somehow. Even though I know very well that busyness is not the same thing as productivity. That sometimes you have to stop to be productive at some point. So sometimes our busyness is about making us feel important. Sometimes our busyness is about our insecurities. You know that person at the office? The one who is the first to arrive in the morning, the last to leave at night? The one who, who answers emails and texts in the middle of the night. The one you almost have to force to take vacation against their will and 
has that big stack of work always on their desk where everyone can see it. Sometimes the reason why they do all that is because they're afraid. They are afraid that if they stop doing everything, all of a sudden their co-workers and their company might realize that they can actually manage without them. And what happens to them then? So some of the reasons that for our business go really deep, and they point to some deep insecurities, some deep fears, some deep needs that are not being met. So Jesus would ask you to look at, at why you are so busy, why you do what you do. And it's not that there's not good reasons to do what you do. I mean, you might say, yeah, I do what I do because I've got people who are depending on me. I've got my family who need this and that and shelter and, and, and freedom and, and food, and I work for that. And absolutely, that is a good and noble reason to work and to be busy. But Jesus would ask you to examine even that and look deeper. Why do you look after your family? Why do you take care of your family? Ultimately, I believe it's so that those people may be free to be the people they were made to be, to, to honor God in their own way, to work for God's kingdom. That is that, that dream of the world that God always intended here in this world, in their own way. See, this is what Jesus thinks we need to be working for in all that we do. Strive first for the kingdom of God, he says, and for his righteousness, for those greater purposes, those deeper needs, and all these other things, the food, the shelter, the clothing, the things you need, they will fall into place. That is the promise. This morning we've been given a wonderful gift. This morning two people Alicia, Ryan, have shared with us an incredible gift. For they have been blessed, deeply blessed, with the gift of their second child, Lily. As you've seen, a beautiful library. And yet they have chosen to share that blessing and their joy in it and their celebration of their child with us today. We have been allowed to be part of it. And I don't think we always realize what an incredible privilege it is to be there and to be part of a pivotal moment in a family's life. But that's what we are today. And so I think that if Jesus were among us today and he wanted to really speak to us, you know what he might say to us? He probably wouldn't say, consider the birds, because we can't see them. Not in here. And he might not say, consider the lilies of the field, because, well, we don't bring lilies in here too often, they make people sneeze. But if we were here, he might just say, consider Lily. Consider Lily. Look at her. Does she work? No. Does she earn her keep? Nope, she's a parasite on society. He doesn't do anything. She doesn't earn anything. She uh, doesn't think beyond the next meal, beyond what might be making her uncomfortable right now. And yet, despite the fact that she earns none of this, does she have her needs met? Absolutely. She lacks for nothing. Why? Because she has two people for whom she means the world and who will give her what she needs. Not because she earns it, but because they love her. And they provide for her, and she has learned already to trust in that provision and, and not to be afraid. And she knows that. Even more important, Lily knows, and I think this is really significant, Lily, know, Lily knows that she matters. That she is important. And how does she know it? Because she sees it. She, she sees it in the eyes of her parents. She sees it in the eyes of her sister and the other people in her life. She matters, and she just knows it. She didn't have to earn that. She didn't have to roll over or 
sit up on our own or do any of the other things on that little checklist of developmental stages. She just mattered. She knew that she mattered. She knew she matters. She knows she matters. But here's the amazing thing. You all have that voice. Every single one of you. I mean, unless you grew up in a situation, a horrendous situation, where you were not given the basic needs of life, you had that. You knew that at one point. And then, you decided you had to earn it. You forgot that you had it. And you got busy. That's why Jesus would ask us to consider Lily, because we are all Lily. We are, in our essence, at our core, all Lily. We are all that child under the care of a loving parent. Uh, uh, and we get our meaning and our significance from that loving parent. Who, every time he looks at us, lets us know how much we matter. And we are under the care of a parent who will take care of what we need. Yes, God will give us what we need. That doesn't mean that God will give us what we want. Because what parent, what loving, good parent will always give to their child what she wants? Mom, I want to play with matches. No. But what loving parent would not, would fail to give to her daughter? his son, what they needed to thrive. If it was in their power to give, and all things are in God's power, consider Lily because you are Lily. That's who you were made to be. That's who you are at your core. And if you can get that, that lesson into your heart, maybe you wouldn't have to be so busy running over what you already have. Let's take a few moments to consider. 